Welcome back to the Imaginary Gallery. It's TJ, your host. Tonight we have a viewer question. So what I will do in this video is read the question and the response, provide my own opinion on the matter, as well as bring in some other viewpoints. Since these are public postings, I'll go ahead and say the name. Terry Arnold said, I appreciate your multidimensional coverage of this topic. I have been studying narcissistic personality disorder for over three years now, and I have discovered your channel recently. I have learned a lot from your videos. I look forward to watching all of your video posts. Your real-life story, encounters, and examples of these creatures has solidified my conclusions about what they truly are and that they are not capable of any type of change for the better. I allowed one of these creatures to get the better of me, and it's not until recently that I've had any hope that it did not get the best of me. There are a number of people that cover this topic that say that one must forgive these creatures in order to move on. Have you covered that topic? I would appreciate your thoughts on forgiveness. I can barely forgive myself for falling prey to this trash, yet in the past I've been able to forgive the creature seemingly more easily. There was another posting from Anita Barneycastle. It says, Terry Arnold, I'd like to know how to give forgiveness to and put this life lesson behind me. And then Terry responded, most important as far as forgiveness is concerned for me is to be able to forgive myself unconditionally for this whole experience and understand that it has changed me. I've got entangled in forgiveness and acceptance towards the disordered creature that was not good for my well-being. However, maybe in the future some degree of forgiveness sounds good as long as it benefits me. I'm interested to know what others' experiences have been with this topic. I feel the same way as you, that I want to be free of this, knowing that I will always be mindful that these creatures exist. Excellent question, and no, I have not addressed this one yet. Since I don't consider myself to be the expert on such questions, before answering, I thought I would quote a few other sources. One was an article I came across called, Should You Forgive Your Narcissist Who've Hurt You? It's by a Judith. Acosta, licensed social worker. She states that in our dialogue about these creatures, many of her readers have shared their own stories. The damage that some people can cause is really bad. The wounds that they inflict because of the thoughtlessness or pure malice can last a lifetime. Some of the viewers wrote about their pain. Some were enraged, some longed for reconciliation, and others for vindication. Others wanted revenge, plain and simple, while others talked about letting go. And then she asks, how does one proceed after living with or being raised by a narcissistic creature? And then she tells us there are choices. Some of the people involved in such a situation, she says, will choose to go to the court and struggle for some kind of sense of justice. She states it's a noble but arduous road. Ultimately, it's a judicial crap shoot. You got one lawyer playing against another. Unpredictable juries and the participation of the original perpetrator who's usually far from remorseful and to whom you are tied for the duration of this proceeding. Sometimes it is hugely successful, but others it's painful beyond words. Other people choose to take the road of least resistance, avoidance, and amnesia. The author says that she can understand this. It can seem a very safe place to be. Unfortunately, it usually ends up quite the opposite because it's a trance of kind. While some people call this letting go, it's not. It's a numbing. We ignore the wound, but it can fester, affecting how we receive and participate in all other relationships, from the point of injury and forward. Some people refuse all the above and instead rest in the familiarity of active anger and resentment. One lady she knew said she would never give up her anger, even if her life depended upon it. And the author asked why, and the response was, it fuels me. Some people want to forgive, not forget, not appease, not roll over, but forgive. But what does forgiveness mean is her question. So then she defines forgiveness. But I was struggling with this thought too because we all have the idea of what forgiveness is, but there's possibly a definition that may contradict our thoughts. 
the word forgiveness has been used interchangeably with the word appeasement for many reasons. The least of which is accuracy, and the greatest of which is our spiritual survival. This is a grave mistake. The author's observations may be of some service in understanding and clarifying the erroneous notion that forgiveness should ever be equated with appeasement or to be confused with unearned trust. They are not only unequal, but they are opposite. How we forgive, as well as why we ought to offer forgiveness, are fundamentally important psychologically as well as spiritually. Forgiveness and appeasement must both be very clearly defined. Forgiveness is letting go of hatred, resentment, and pointless, pervasive, and paralyzing fear. It doesn't mean that we must be foolishly fearless or naive. It does not mean that we've stopped protecting ourselves or deny what's truly dangerous to us around us. It doesn't mean that we ignore the obvious or trust what's intrinsically untrustworthy. It doesn't mean that we relinquish our God-given capacities for discernment and good judgment. When evil comes a-knocking, we should lock the door. Forgiveness is not banal and is never another word for niceness. Appeasement, on the other hand, often parades as benevolence but is actually cowardice, a derivative of a particular form of fear that is so consuming, so pervasive and pathological that it is flatly denied. When we appease, we essentially give up rational fear even though we may truly need it. But we think by being nice or by giving the bully what it wants, that it will stop being a bully. Appeasement does not prevent bad behavior. It perpetuates and encourages it. That is foolish. Forgiving is not excusing or denial. The author personally believes that there are things that right-mindedness and spiritual maturity call us to do and not to do. This author wants to state up front that a great deal of her thinking on these matters has been influenced by C.S. Lewis who gave us quite a bit to digest on the issue of forgiveness. Quote, I find that when I'm asking God to forgive me, I am often asking him to do something quite different. I am asking him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you've done this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly the same as it was before. But excusing says, I see that you couldn't help it, or didn't mean it, you weren't really to blame. If one was not really to blame, then there is nothing to forgive. If we forget this, we shall go away imagining that we have repented and been forgiven, when all that has really happened is that we've satisfied ourselves with our own excuses. The author states, Real forgiveness between two people, as C.S. Lewis rightly points out, does not mean pretending the hurt has not occurred and does not require that we look away from the wrongdoing. Forgiveness, even God's forgiveness, which is infinite, starts with a steady gaze at the wrongdoing itself. To forgive entails acknowledgement of the hurt and then when there's a contrition and a repentance, a reconciliation. As Mr. Lewis reminds us again and again, true forgiveness demands that we look at the deed squarely, seeing it in all of its horror, after which we're able to extend compassion and be reconciled with the person but not with the deed. The deed and all its underpinnings must be shed for good. It is this understanding of forgiveness that makes it possible to fight an enemy without hating it. Forgiveness is not codependent. Many people who come into this person's office live with rather troubled people, some of them truly horrible. Some of them are being abused. Some are stuck in situations with alcoholic parents that are frighteningly chaotic. Others are in marriages with addicts or thieves who are stripping them of every reasonable creature comfort. She knows one lady whose addicted husband stole all of her clothing to sell on the street so he could buy a night's worth of methamphetamine. By the time she was able to take her daughter and herself to a battered woman's shelter, she had all their worldly goods contained in one paper shopping bag. Traumatized people who are individuals, not collectives or organizations, immigrants from Cambodia, North Korea, parts of Africa, victims of abuse, can't help but bristle at the mention of the word forgiveness and the author understands why they do. She also knows why they'll never recover without it. Her task is to help them see that forgiveness does not mean that they need to allow the behavior to continue or accept the next empty promise any more than acceptance means approval. In their lexicon, the word forgiveness implies that they have to pretend they were never abused or tortured or victimized. 
To forgive in their minds means a tacit cooperation in the codependency and abuse. When the author says the word acceptance, their hearts hear denial, and their minds see a continuation of all that's wrong and truly, morally, and emotionally unacceptable. It's very important for there to be some contrition and an effort to change the negative behavior in order for forgiveness to be wholeheartedly given and for reconciliation, person to person, nation to nation, to take place. Father Russell Radokiek an Orthodox priest in Boot, Montana, clarifies it this way. Consider the difference between I'm sorry and please forgive me. One's a proclamation, the other is a supplication. One involves I, one involves the other. One is prideful and arrogant, almost a rant. The other is humble, contrite. There is no doubt that he is right and that we must be savvy enough and clear-minded enough to know the difference so that we are not manipulated into putting ourselves in harm's way. He's never heard a narcissist or sociopath sincerely say, quote, forgive me, end quote. However, a full reconciliation may depend on repentance. Our forgiveness does not. In fact, we can forgive a person who's quite ill and committed to a path of destruction using words we've heard before. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Putting ourselves in harm's way is another matter. As far as my own views on the subject of forgiveness, personally, I believe that it did depends on what the situation is. There's a differentiation. Number one situation, are you supposed to forgive your cluster B creature while you're still involved with it? And the second is, do you forgive your cluster B creature once it's all over and you are rid of it? So for the first example, if you're still with it, no, you shouldn't be forgiving it because the things it's doing are deal breakers. They are things that, if you accept, means you're just in for more of the same down the road. You'll, of course, think, certainly this person wouldn't do this again. Okay, I forgive you, and then, guess what? It happens again. As far as the second example, when you're through, I think what the people that say you have to forgive are referring to is you got to forgive, but... Since you're not with it anymore, it's not a matter of saying, Oh, it's okay, you had six other partners behind my back. Come back in my bed! It's not that. It's all over. And I think when you get to this point, it kind of makes the question irrelevant if you realize what you're really questioning about you forgiving it. Because remember, it's a predator. It sets out deliberately to find prey, which would be you. Back to the situation like I described in an older video about the predator lion out in the woods and there's a little birdie and its leg is broken and it can't get off the ground. And this creature, who's a predator, is hungry and sees it as easy prey and attacks it. Well, if you were that bird and somehow you survived, would you be thinking to yourself, Am I going to forgive that creature for trying to eat me alive? You see, it doesn't really fit because that is what these creatures do. You were there, their prey, and they went after you. It's best just to look at it as I got involved with such a creature and that's unfortunate. The most important part is, again, forgiving yourself because, after all, you were fooled by a skilled con artist. You had no way of knowing this. You may have tried to uncover, like, are you a con artist? But you, of course, will be told, oh, you're crazy. I just like you. But I would look at it the same as if, say, you're traveling on your own to meet a friend in a different city you've never been to, and you're nervous, you're scared, it's your first time to travel, and you look like a tourist. You're rummaging through your bags, you're looking at a map, you're putting your glasses on and reading it. To any observing person, you're going to look like a typical tourist. So, let's say you are terrified. You feel completely lost. The way you were told it was is not the way it is. And some charming gentleman steps up and says, Can I help you with something? I'm really good as far as directions around the city. Basically looks at you, sees that you're desperate, don't know where you're at, and immediately offers a solution. Well, of course, you at that moment feel a tremendous feeling of relief. Like, oh, someone's going to help me. Oh, how lucky am I for this? And you may go along with this. If this situation was over and you went a second time to a trip and you had a circumstance just like that one and some other person came up and offered their assistance, you would probably accept it if you're that terrified. Well, that's the whole thing is 
they are actors. They are pretending to be what they think you need. And in our real lives, we see this and think, wow, this is great. And we're willing to let go of any red flags we may see or feel and let this person help us. It's just natural. So anybody could fall for that in that circumstance. So that's why we need to forgive ourselves because we couldn't have known any better. Even if we suspected and said something, we'd be shot down and then we'd want to believe what they're saying. I think it's best rather than thinking of forgiving them is maybe saying, yes, I forgive the person. Really, it means you understand that you were dealing with a non-human creature. You didn't have any way of knowing it was a non-human creature and it did what it did with the intention to hurt you, just like the predator out in the woods to the little birdie, just the way they are. So if you can accept that and forgive yourself, then you're probably going to be okay, eventually. But it takes time. I am the narcopath. I've been told I've got to give you another confession. I don't like doing it, but if it means my freedom so I can get another target, I'm all for it. I know when I first met you, I swore that you were the only one that I would let near my private part. I know you hadn't touched him yet, and I'd become pregnant. My plan was to pin that on you, but because you were so polite and wouldn't even go that far, now I am forced to have to chase another guy for alimony. Thanks a lot. But I meant what I said when I told you I loved you. I hope you understand. Just in case you're a little confused and wonder, what do these things equate to me using you? I made sure to tell you at any opportunity just how horrible life was with my poor roommate. I was hoping you'd get the hint and eventually asked me to stay with you when that didn't happen. I knew you had the car, I knew you had the home, so I called you that night in a fit of tears about how I just didn't know what I was going to do. I can't stay here one more night with these awful roommates. And you took the bait and you asked me to stay with you. So how did I use you for one and two? Well, way number one, I used you. Remember the first night you took me out? And you said you had to stop by your place and apologize like it would be some kind of inconvenience? I was counting on it and hoping on it, because that allowed me to start my assessment right off the bat. Number one was real estate. Empty real estate, aside from you. You see, I'd been living with my whore roommate who had crackheads spending the night on our porch every night. I couldn't get a beauty night's sleep, so when I saw that you had your own place and it was big enough for me and my things, that scored you points. Way number two was transportation. Notice how I casually asked you, Ooh, you rent this car? Or is this your roommate's car? When you told me that you owned it, Point number two, I knew that there was hope for you as my next love interest. Hey, honey, I love this song. Come dance with me. Hey, hey, it's me. It's me. Hey, where are you going? You don't want to dance with me? 